Are live. Hello everyone, this is Thomas Pop here with Video Mantis, and we're doing another Video Mantis discussion. We're going a little later on this Tuesday. I had a few things that I had to do earlier, actually return some gear. I was working this past week, and I was just too tired, and I'm like, I got to get this back before it's late. Um, so I did that. But we have Evan Freeman Hello. in today. How you doing, buddy? Good. How you doing? I'm doing Sounds amazing. Like you had man. a busy weekend. Yeah, you know, it's just uh, luckily, uh, just like you were talking about a few minutes ago, it has been pretty slow for some of us, and then everything just lined up in like one week. So I had like four jobs with four different clients, which obviously brings up its own intricacies and problems. You know, I mean. The one thing that I notice is that when you're going from job to job to job, you know, one was a commercial, one was a documentary, one was just an interview. It's not wanting to bring my whole arsenal to every single yeah, job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that's where things get lost and stuff. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I actually do bring most of my arsenal to every job because I never know what, like, bag of tricks they might, you know. That's true. Pull out on me or, like, you know, curveballs they might throw me. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, I understand that. I'm constantly derigging, you know, the cart to the bag, back to the cart, and, you know, moving things around, different routings, everything. Is, all the settings are always different. It's so, so frustrating. Yeah, you know, you know? just got to make sure I prep it. That's all the stuff that a lot of people don't understand that we do, this prep work. You know, just because we're getting there, like, this is one thing I had to talk to a client about, um, we did a commercial and I saw that the call time was nine o'clock in the morning. And, you know, it was a basic interview set up and everything, but they wanted me to come in at 12 and then they wanted the, uh, the talent to be like right in at 12 o'clock too. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, do you realize that when that talent comes in, everybody starts freaking out mm -hmm. and they're like, we got to go. And everybody's like, Oh, and everything. And if you just get me showing up and now I have to start doing everything. Yeah. Um, that's going to like, piss people off <laughs> it's gonna you know stress them out they're gonna be like come on we got to move it I mean, why are you being why is this taking so long and it's like well it's not actually taking that long this is how long the process takes uh, yeah of course yeah right mm -hmm. so it's like anytime i see that stagger i just show up at the same time as the camera guys i just go i ain't, I ain't playing this game yeah of course you know mm -hmm. and go from there um but yeah so why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how did you get into sound um well, I started, you know, sound when I was DJing. So, let's see, back in like 1998, 99, I was hitting hitting the rave scene pretty big, you know, nice. and uh, fell in love with DJing and electronic music. So, um, of course, I bought some turntables, started doing that. Quickly realized that the big DJs were also producers. Yeah. So that led me to get wanting to learn how to, you know, like produce music and run DAWs and all that. Went to recording school. Um, got out. Which one? It was a school in North Hollywood. It was called Sound Masters. It was on Vineland and Magnolia. It's no longer there. It was actually like across. I don't know if you're familiar with North Hollywood, but a little bit. Yeah. Um, there's like a big Ralphs and Carl's Jr. right on the corner there. I know that Carl's Jr. Right across sure. the street from yeah. that. Um, the guy who ran it died, and so they sold the school, and I think it got bought out by Pinnacle College. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but um, yeah. So it was a one-year recording program in studio for music, and. I got out, and I quickly realized that the music industry was just not the way to go, yeah. especially with Napster happening yep. and all the downloading and the torrents and everything. Yep. So um, I had a cousin who was doing you know, camera work for some reality shows, and he brought me on. He's like, you know how to work a mixer, a mic, 
Um, we'll give you the gear. We'll, you'll, you know, you, you'll use our gear, and we'll throw you out there. And that was my film school. Like, threw me right in the fire. Yeah, that's how you have to do it. Yeah. You so, know? Yeah. Wow. Luckily, they were easy shows. They were like um, home and garden television shows. So, you know, two people painting a room for 30 minutes while talking. So yeah. Not too stressful, but hey, I was like, what? what is this? Put the mic here. Make sure the level's well, here. Well, that wasn't the problem. Yeah. The, the problem, actually, the first thing for me to learn was, RF because in recording school there was no need for RF. Everything yeah. was plugged in. Cabled. Into a yeah, everything's cabled. Everything's in a studio. Right. And um, I got out there. They're like, "Oh, we got five people. I need mics." And it's static. And you know, I'm trying to scan things. Like getting, getting confused. Which transmitter goes to which receiver? Who's wearing what? Like, hold on. Oh no, I just changed it. You know. <laughs> and it was bad. Did they get stressed out with you in the beginning? Like, what were some of the common pitfalls? Whoops. I'm sorry. I think we have a a camera down. Uh, what were uh. some of the common pitfalls that you had while you like? That you remember when you first started out. And while you're doing that, guys, I'm going to play with the camera. Yeah. Um, it was that. I mean, it was just really getting used to the high, you know, the fast pace of reality TV and, um, you know, the demand that everything just has to work when they need it to work. You know, I wasn't used to that. I was used to coming from, like, a you know, school where you can set up and, you know, you can record. Um, so this was my first foray into, like, having people on my back like that. Yeah, really breathing down, like, what's yeah. taking so long. Yeah. You're like, I don't know. And at that time, we weren't doing any, like, recording separately. Everything was to camera. So, you know, I was hardlined to camera oh most gosh. of the time using, like, a Wendex 5 or, like, an right. 33 yep. depending how many cast. And or if you were up. lucky, a 302 at the time, right? Not even, no. Because that, oh, it was yeah. even way before yeah. that. Yeah, it was, yeah. Wow. It was, like, either the Went 5, um, the FP33, or the PSC. Alpha Mix. Mix. Yeah. Wow. All the time. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah. like, what year would that have been? That was 2000. 2000. 2004, right? 2003. Okay. So, right at the brink of where Sound Devices started. Yeah. You know, to like really start, yeah. you know, jumping into that category. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. So, wow. Yeah. Man, <laughs> memories. Um, funny. So, anyways, we're speaking about Comic Con, and the yeah. girl who actually hired me on that job for the first time ever, gave me my first job ever, uh, Yvette, was actually now production manager on the job i just did for comic-con 14 years later oh wow haven't seen her since wow yeah and that's how it works so right? when she sent me an email i said oh i am not getting hired for this job because the last time this girl saw me i was green and i did not know what i was doing wow so she laughed about that because i told her i'm like hey i'm a lot better now yeah I'm exactly i actually know what i'm doing now <laughs> yeah. right you know that's why you got to be nice to everyone that you know because you never know who you're gonna meet right? seriously 14 years later i've not spoken to her since 2004 and that's insane there she is again that's insane yeah. was, man like a work fling one time yeah and then yeah. here you are yeah. that's crazy so that's crazy Wow. Well, I tell you what. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about specifically. Whoop! I'm sorry. You know, I got a couple oh. cameras fritzing on me, but I'll check on that one in a second. Is I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about trade shows and and Comic Con specifically. Um, I haven't done a trade show in a while. I've done a few live uh, instances for um, Twitch TV, um, but nothing like Comic Con. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about like what Comic Con is. And, you know, what are the types of jobs that you can get at Comic-Con? Mm -hmm. Maybe just start spilling the beans a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Comic-Con is madness in a sense. But it's also one of my favorite gigs. I mean, if I can get hired on it every year, I would. Sometimes you don't get that, you know, that luck. Yeah. What uh, makes it so cool? Um, it's just fun. San Diego is a great place. It's beautiful. There's, um, you know, a ton of people down there. Usually you get about, I mean, I don't even know, eight to ten mixers you probably will know that'll be there. Um you know, you got the usual suspects. I'll give shout outs to the regular Comic Con guys. Uh, yeah. Gabe Fergoso usually is there. Um, Adam Young I, is usually there. Um, I know Charlie Mead's done a lot of it. Um, I just saw David Cook this year. He was working out there. It's good to see him. Nice. Um, so, yeah, there's usually a couple of different areas you can get involved. I know people like Gabe usually end up at a booth on the floor in the madness doing whatever live you know, um, live broadcasts or live panels that they're doing right there right. at the booth. So if you're working at, you know, the Xbox booth or whatever, the Marvel booth, and then they have their guys coming in doing their, their discussions right there. Right. Then you've got the guys who are doing the bag work, you know, and that's <laughs> usually what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, you're running around all day. Trucking. Yeah, trucking, um, going from the convention center to hotels to press junkets, back to the streets to the activations. Um, you know, usually you'll have a host with you. And they're just walking around, kind of getting interviews, man-on-the-street interviews. Um, it all depends. 
And then this year, I was lucky enough to be the s- static where I was for the whole time. We had a stage built um, off-site about a couple blocks from the convention center, and I was on a balcony, and we weren't live. We just had a host who was interviewing people, and they were just uploading content as fast as they could, but not live. Hmm. So that was great this year. That's cool. Yeah, I gained a lot of weight this year instead of losing it. Yeah, there so, you go. Exactly yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what are some of the troublesome things that happen when you're working in these live situations? I'm sorry. Li- well, I get. yeah, it is live. Yeah. You know, when you're working in these huge conventions with 30, 40, 50 different mixers, um, you know, wh- what are the th- different types of problems that can happen? Yeah, um, of course, we have, you know, the frequency problem. Um, there is a We even have a Facebook group, Comic-Con Sound Mixers, mm-hmm. where – People have been pretty good about vocalizing, like, hey, I'm on this, these, you know, this is what mics I'm using, what blocks I'm on, these frequencies. Nice. Um, and obviously, the convention center, you're not allowed to have a boom or really be cable to camera just because there's so many people and, you know, it's dangerous. Okay, so it's all wireless. Yeah, so you're using, you know, wireless hop to camera and then either like a wireless handheld stick mic and a lav on the host or, mm-hmm. you know, maybe a couple stick mics, you know, some mic flags. And, you're just kind of walking around hoping that you're not stepping on somebody else at that point. Yeah. You know? um, usually what a lot of people do is they get to where they're going to be. They scan, they fire up the transmitter, and they just leave it burning all day. Yep. You've got to, like, claim your territory. Yeah, you're, you're just basically claiming. You're like, I'm squatting here. This is mine. Back off. Like, yep. Get off my lawn. Get there early <laughs> and and do it. So don't – make sure you take that pre-call on that yeah, day for ex- sure. Exactly. Exactly. Man. So – um. But usually it works out pretty good. I mean, I haven't heard too many horror stories of somebody walking by with their host and all of a sudden their host is blasting through a speaker of some other you know, <laughs> panel where they're not expecting it. Like, whoa. Yeah. Anytime you turn on a Sennheiser G3, it's 518.500, right? Exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? So if you don't change that channel, everybody's on that channel. Of course. And, it, and you do. You have like the, the smaller news guys and the smaller YouTubers that go and they try to, you know, just, they got their little G3 set up and they're not really thinking about frequencies. Making and, their blogs. Yeah. And they'll come by. <laughs> you know sweep you and whatever whatever happens yep so, it happens yeah. it happens the uh, the woes you know yeah having to record locally sometimes helps yeah you know so yeah. this this year was my biggest challenge was the noise because we we're on a balcony of our yeah. sci-fi had uh, an activation at um, a balcony up on top yeah so there's a children's museum and we were on the second floor on this ba- patio balcony and below us was this giant human claw machine they had built. So basically, people would wait in line. They would strap them in a harness, hang them upside down over a bunch of like mystery boxes, and they were the claw. And they would get. Oh, okay. And that actually wasn't too loud. That was okay. It was our sci-fi karaoke bus that decided to pull up and park every you know 20 minutes in front of our right by our balcony, blasting music and people screaming and singing karaoke. Oh boy. So you know, having to deal with that. Um, That's hard. Yeah. Yeah. So we worked it out. It was good. But that was like my biggest challenge this year was just the noise, you know. That's funny. Yeah. And they didn't want stick mics. So they wanted everybody on lav only. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, what did you do? uh, What types of uh, wireless were you using? Uh, I was just using standard Electros and uh, Cost 11s. Luckily, uh, their backs were to a lot of like the street. So it wasn't up too much. Um, But yeah, I mean, they were all happy, happy with it. So no complaints. They just put a little music over some of it if they had to. I remember probably about seven or eight years ago, I was working uh, at the Zaxcom booth for NAB. Um, you know, just, hey, this is the wireless, you know, it's show and, it's show and tell basically for four days. But, you know, it's kind of like you having the karaoke booth coming. Mm-hmm. We had a booth that was across the, you know, the walkway from us, you know, so it's only about 15 feet away. Um, that just had a bunch of Samsung TVs and different like w- speakers or whatever. <laughs> but the they had one TV that was just in the like facing the uh, the aisleway, looking straight at us, and it just it was blaring Rob Thomas that one song. This is it now, <laughs> everybody getting down that about that about. This is I'm a you know, and it was yeah, just thank, thank, you're welcome, Facebook. Whew, I'm telling you, I heard that song so many times that I overnighted a product from Amazon. It's called that TV Be Gone. Ah. And what it does is you hit a button and it just goes off, 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 off on every single TV code that it knows. It's like 50,000 codes. Yeah. I took that and I just went thunk and it turned the TV off. So for like the next two or three days, I just kept freaking doing it until they realized something was going on and flipped it 180 degrees. 
win. Oh, nice. I That's like how it. you do it. There you go. You know, you I used have to have to a go. watch that did that same thing. It was like a universal <laughs> remote watch. I used to. That's mess amazing. With the people at Circuit City. They still have Circuit City? I don't know. But S- back Circuit City? Yeah, back, in the, used back, to call in, it? back in the day. Used that to was my people. first job in California. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> Let me tell yeah. you, here I come going like, man, I can like solder up a recording studio. They're like, that's nice. You know, put these boxes over yeah, there. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> So, man. Yeah, well. so I say, like, uh, just conventions. I mean, like you said, you've done NAB. We've all done mm-hmm. CES, E3, all those. Um, they're just their own beast. It's a lot of, you know, most important things are having a comfortable pair of shoes and a comfortable harness. And, you know, right. you're going to be walking around all day. A ton. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the minute you try to take that bag off to take a break, they're like, oh, we got something. We got to go. We got we an interview go. right now. Yep, exactly. So just wearing it. Dude, stretching. Oh, my uh, God. Yeah. You know, like, anytime I'm going to do, like, a huge show like that, I know it sounds stupid, but I will stretch, like, in the morning and at night. Like, because your back, even when you're wearing those, you know, your back is getting kind of crunched a little bit. And yeah. it's just really good to, like, crack the back out at the end of the night. Mm-hmm. Um, that and the hot tub at the end of the night. Oh, God. <laughs> you have a hot tub? I don't have a hot tub. No, no. I mean, if you're lucky enough at your hotel. Oh, you know, yeah. At, if, yeah. You're, if you're off-site, you know. Yeah. Um, my clients don't put me up in places that uh, nice. Well, Jesus. Yeah, there's always a bathtub and ah. warm water. Epsom salt. <laughs> <laughs> um, Crazy. Yeah, so that's... What else do you bring? Like, do you... I mean, I know that one thing that I definitely bring is we have pouches in our bag, or if you're wearing a backpack... Um, I bring extra food because mm-hmm. I just never the the trade show hot dogs are seventeen fifty. Yeah, a glass of water is you know your left leg. Yeah. Um. So having your own sustenance for the day, at least to get you through to where you can get some actual food, is a good thing. Do you wear a backpack? Um. No, not usually. You just wear your bag. Yeah, right? I usually wear my bag. Um. Depends on like the situation. Sometimes I will wear a backpack because I do like the way it evens me out, kind of front and yeah. back, and um, just to have all the extra stuff with me. This year, I just brought the whole case. Like I just brought my Fat Max full of everything. I was, you know, on yeah, because you're stationary. Yeah, which I'm glad I did because you know there was a lot of curveballs thrown at me that I needed stuff that if I would just brought a bag, I wouldn't have been able to do what they wanted. So, yeah, you know. So what do you think a standard uh, kit would be for a Comic-Con if you're walking around? I know if you're doing a live setup, that's a completely yeah. different animal. Yeah. To- I totally respect that. But, like, you know, if you're if, if somebody's calling you up, if a production company's calling you up and saying, hey, we got a camera, we've got this, you know, video web series that we're doing, and uh, I need a sound guy to follow around this guy as he interviews people, what do you think a basic package would look like? Um, I would say like you would definitely, you know, um, a six, three, three is probably great. It's lightweight. If you don't mm-hmm. need all those tracks, um, two handheld mics, because obviously, you know, the conventions are noisy. So anything you can do to cut down the noise of the back, you know, the background noise is good. And are you bringing handhelds wireless as well as cabled as backups or I'm usually like, what are you doing to CYA cover your ass? Yeah. I'm usually bringing a handhelds with a plug on so it can either go hardlined or oh wireless. nice okay yeah, so cool. usually i'll have you know two srs two dedicated for stick mics and then two for wires nice so i think if you had a 633 with two receivers a couple stick mics and a couple lobs then you'd be good and a boom obviously if you go outside the convention center and then you're just doing quick man on the street interviews and you know you can get the boom in there that's right. nice to have. But do you need a slate for these types of jobs or is that just kind of um, overkill? Well, you're usually sending wirelessly to camera. Right. So it's wireless both. audio and yeah. time code no, or just both? Wi- just wireless audio usually. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess it all depends on what camera they're shooting with. If they're shooting DSLRs and you really can't do much with that. So it's nice. I usually bring a little micro frame. So okay. instead of like um, a regular slate, I, uh, I don't know if you've seen the microframes or like these little red boxes like that big. Interesting. And they just display time code. Like oh. There's no sticks on them. There's no nothing. Man, I've never seen those to be yeah. honest. That's yeah, cool. I think uh, Blaz turned me on to it a long time ago. Awesome. Um, great. So I usually just flash that to the DSLR and let them do that. Um, Very cool. But yeah, if it's going to be a big like, you know, HDX or a big camera, like a re- regular camera, usually hops are on it. Um, mm-hmm. And... If they ask, you know, I'll have a locket box if they decide they want one. Um, but otherwise, you know, keep it pretty light. Exactly. You know. That's crazy. So, okay, so you said that you've done a lot of, like, the bag rigs, and now you're doing more of the live sit-down stuff. What? And you said that they threw you a couple curveballs. What were those? Um, okay, so we had a whole tech meeting, you know, about mm-hmm. two days before the con about how Post was going to work. And, okay. And... Um, you know, we all agreed that cameras will get locket boxes and audio would be record multi-track. 
um, they were used to their ENG guys who were just running around with like a stick mic and a boom. So they just they thought everything can go to camera. They're like stick mic on one, boom on two. They didn't realize that we we're gonna have more guests, more mics, and we can't do that. Yeah, you gotta mix it. Yeah, exactly. I need to multi-track. Um, so the night I get there, the girl from Post says she now wants connectivity between stage and Post. So now they don't want to go to the cards. They want audio going to camera, down the SDI line to Avid, and you know they can just take it from there, edit it quickly, and upload it. Wow. So no problem. I had my cart with me. I was able to, um, you know, do all that. Ran mono mixes um, to first channel on the three cameras. So we had a camera on the host, camera on the guest, and then a wide shot. So we had mono mix to channel one on all cameras, and then host channel two on her camera. Guest on channel two of the other camera, and then a camera mic for channel three or channel two on the third camera on the wide shot. Okay. So that that took care of all their need. You know, there was really never any more than like two or three guests on the show. Um, so that took care of their need. We locked, we we uh, sync all the cameras, but then post um, was saying the cameras were out of sync, and I said, "All right, uh -oh. so we double yeah, <laughs> double check like five times." Me and the tech uh, tech girl. Um, all the cameras were their F FS7s, all okay. all in time up up where we were, but somewhere down the SDI line they weren't getting time code. Interesting. To the Avids. Okay. So it wasn't slaving to that time exactly. code. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you know, of course, the first thing they did was accuse my locket boxes of not working, and the cameras couldn't be in sync. I think we need to pause for a second and say, if anyone's listening to this, never accuse somebody. It's so much easier to be like. Hey, guys, you know what? We're, we're sensing a little bit of an abnormality or something. Maybe we can, like, all check our workflows yeah. and, and figure it out together because yeah. that's what happens, yeah. you know, instead of just going, oh, his stuff doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, so, you know, the poor tech manager is running around up and down trying to figure out why. He's like, well, this locket box, uh, I'm using the, the Mose gears. Okay. And I don't know if you use them. You know, you've got the little dials for audio level yeah. and mm -hmm. frame rate. So one. Yeah, in fact, you know what? I have one. You have can, one? Yeah. Do you, can I grab it? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, give me one second. Yeah, talk about it. But I've got one within arm's reach of me. Yeah. So, anyways, um, obviously, I have two different versions. I have the Limo and the BNC. And sometimes the BNC version, you need to turn up the volume a little bit on the time code to get it to actually jam. Yeah. Here we go. Is that the guy you have? Yeah. Exactly. The Q28 nice. right here. Okay. And I've got the Max. Yeah. So basically, you've got frame rate right here, and time code level. So frame rate time code level. Yep. So usually with the BNC one, I find that I have to turn this level up a little bit to get jam on some cameras, sometimes mm -hmm. the FS7, you know. I don't have the problem with the Limo. So mine, one of them was turned to like 3 o'clock while the other one was in zero. So the first thing you said, well, this one's set to zero, zero, and the other one's set to zero, and like 3 o'clock, can we turn them all to zero and make sure it's working? <sighs> I was like, sure, that's not really the problem, but we can go ahead and do that. Exactly. Um, so I did everything I could to make him happy. You know, he's a tech manager. He's used to a live environment. Mm -hmm. um, turns out that they just need audio um, time code directly into the Avid system itself. So mm. there's no way to take it from the – Don't pass it through the yeah, SDI it because it can't. Yeah, it wouldn't pass it through the SDI. Oh. Exactly. Well, <laughs> So now we're asking what are we going to do about time code because they don't have locket boxes they don't, or any time code generators downstairs in the post room. So they wanted to – you know, I said, well, is VER open? Can you guys rent a couple of, like, tentacles? And we can just you know, hook three tentacles to the back, and they can just all feed time code. Exactly. And they said VER was out of everything. Everything. Yeah. So I came up with a plan to use my slate as, like, a time code generator. So I, yeah. Jam it and then jam out of it. Yeah, so I had the TS3. It has a little quarter inch out. Yep. Um, I gave them that uh, quarter inch cable out. They got a DA converter and ran out of that, split the signal to three avids. Boom, everything was in sync. Wow. Good, yeah. So in the end, they were happy. So, you know, Wait a minute. You were actually split out of that and it worked? Yeah. Boom. How many times? Three? I think they went into. I think they went out of my slate into the AD converter and split out the converter. Oh, into, okay. Into each Avid system. That's cool. Okay, yeah. cool. So it only had to get into one. Yeah. Dude, that's so awesome. Yeah. So it's the whole time ingenious. my slate lived on a table by their editing system, just feeding a time code all, all day. Wow. So they were really happy with that, like totally saved their, their asses on that because they didn't think about that. Yeah. And um, gave them all the mixes to camera they wanted and went off without a hitch. Not mm. one complaint. You right. coming back because you saved the day just <laughs> like a superhero. Yeah. No, know? no. They were they were really happy with that. So that's, okay. that's why I bring everything. So. so 
Is there anything that like happens at Comic Con stays at Comic Con? Like, are, it, does Gabriel Fergoso dress up like Link or something like that? I, I, Please that's tell not me. For me to does. say, I'm sorry, Gabe. You're, uh, come on, I'm come sure on. There's, there's pictures. No, yeah, <laughs> have, it's great. I mean, we're always trying to meet up with everybody afterwards. We're, yeah. We always have all these great plans. Like, oh, hey, I'm getting off at seven. Let's all meet up for a drink. Mm-hmm. But you know, by the time the day's done, people are exhausted, so tired. You gotta get back to your hotel. And, you know, everybody's spread out. Some people are in the gas lamp. Some people are a little farther down. Some, some people, people are, are driving back some home people are to driving, Glendale. Yeah, some <laughs> people live in the Oceanside, and they go back and forth. Yeah. Um, so it's tough to meet up with everybody, and the gas lamp gets really crowded at that time. Mm-hmm. So this year I got to see a couple of people. I got to see um, Jacob Varley down there, David Cook. Um, nice. James DeVore. I was trying to meet up with um, – Brandon Pert, but I wasn't able to meet up with him, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But, you know, every year it's fun. Um, it's 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 crazy. Like, I wish this year I got to walk the floor more because that's where the fun is. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a good time. Very cool. Yeah, I always enjoy it. Man. You should go down one time. Dude, I would love to, man. I just have never had the clients that ask. And to be honest, I have n- i don't know how to get tickets. Like, every time it's like, hey, Comic-Con's coming, and it's all sold out. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll try next year. It's like that's one sold out too. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, I mean, it's like it's like Burning Man. It's how like do unless you get you, in? unless you're going like regularly, you're not in the know of when I, like to get the tickets or how to get them. I gotta dress up like Sonic the Hedgehog and just like try to run in or something yeah, like that. That's it. Yeah. I don't know. And this year know. was even uh, was even stricter. Usually they allow people around the convention center because they have different activations. So they'll be like, oh, this is like the Castle Rock activation, like little thing people wait in line to go through the c- Castle Rock, or they had this year they had a Jack Ryan activation with like a big helicopter and a VR experience. Oh, wow. Um, but now, you this year, you actually need a badge to get within like a certain perimeter of the convention center itself. Not just Crazy. to go in, but to get like within like a certain distance. They got to be so safe now, man. Yeah. You know, because yeah. there's so many crazy kids, you know. Yeah. You know, especially there, you know, it's like, is that a real Halo guy or not a real Halo guy? Yeah. I feel like there is just everybody's there to have a good time. Nobody's. Yeah. Nobody's got any like malice intense, you know. That's good. Down there. Yeah. So and this year they had the scooters. That was fun. They had a little birds and lime scooters you can hop on. And oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I tried one just the other day for the first time and I almost wiped out. <laughs> and it was so hard. But uh, man, I'm getting so old. Like, you don't have no balance anymore. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dude, I had this crazy thing that happened recently. Uh, I just did a commercial for a couple days. Um, and uh, it was a little bit of a lower budge uh, one. And unfortunately, they had uh, the DIT station. They had a PA ratchet the, the whole uh. entire cart in. And they didn't do it right. And so as soon as they got to the set, it was completely down on its side. Oh, man. I'm actually going to bring him in on another Mantis discussion to talk to him because I was super impressed with the way that he handled the situation because I would have been just, just like – Just attacked he had. Who, who do I kill? Like, yeah. who do I kill? <laughs> you know, that that's the, that's what I would have been like. Yeah. Um, no, nah, I'm teasing. I wouldn't be that bad. Um, but, yeah, he just had this complete just perfect poise of – it's just gear. It is what it is. It's actually happened before, so I know what to do. Mm-hmm. Everything's fine. It'll be taken care of. Wow. You know? And I was just really impressed, you know. Um, and we even had a, the situation because the PA was there. I could see. I was like, which one did it? And it's like, that one. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> can just tell. The one guy who's got his back turned and yeah. doesn't want to look at anybody in the eye. Yeah. And, it, you know, I was talking to them. like, are you okay? And they're just like, man, I just want to, like, stab my heart, like, with a knife. And I was just like, you need to stop that mentality. Yeah. You know, because it's just gear. They have an insurance policy. You didn't get hurt. Nobody got hurt. You yeah. know, I just, you know what? I'm so glad that, um the industry is starting to turn for what I think to be a more positive mentality. You know, yeah. Back in the day, it was all like, you've screwed up. I can't believe you'll never work in this town again. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be a little bit more understanding and a little bit more loving now. And I, I like that. Yeah. You know, I think it's good. Yeah. You know, what types of stories do you have of catastrophic failures on set? Mm. What do you think? In my department or in other departments? Anything, anything that you could think of. Gosh, I had another one. They had a Comtech that was run over by a truck. In fact, <laughs> go uh, take your headphones off. If you go in that upper right-hand bin that's green, it says lost and damaged. You'll see it to right to your left uh, on that on the thing that you think is going to fall. Yeah, like inside there you, at the bottom, you're going to find a Comtech that is – I kept it. I, I think I'm going to like bronze it or something because – is it in there? 
Oh, no, really? I t- maybe I took it out. Man, maybe I did. I don't know. But it, it was literally run over by a semi. So this thing, <laughs> instead of being that thick, it was only like a quarter of an inch thick. Oh, it's it's unreal. Pancaked, it's Completely pancaked. It must have been the camera truck or whatever. Wow. But it just shows what uh, people do to our gear, which yeah. is unreal. Um, I mean, I haven't seen anything too catastrophic. Um, one of the last things I uh, did a couple months ago, you know, a giant green screen almost fell in killed our main actor but oh my uh, god uh, luckily it blew the other way instead of forward on him so how does that happen uh i don't know the combo stands were bent so obviously like they they bagged it the wind was just too big of a green screen on an outside windy day that just couldn't handle it wow. yeah the combo stand was just like bent like metal just they couldn't Crazy. even close it down. Like, okay we're going to lunch <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. The, and the joke was um the joke uh Basically, the main character runs like a, a jet ski academy. Okay. And the joke is, you know, like he's never really goes on a jet ski. Like, you know, <laughs> he just runs his academy. And, the, you know, in the thing, they make a line where it says, well, if he ever sat on a jet ski, he would probably die. And then we were shooting this stuff with him on the jet ski in front of a green screen to get these little wipes and stuff. And, and he almost dies. And it literally <laughs> almost happens. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What a nightmare. Yeah. What so, a nightmare. But usually, I mean, I feel like. Most of the crews these days are pretty safe, and everything is, you know, run pretty well. Um, Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anything too catastrophic, thank God, luckily. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to see anything bad happen. No, no way. No way. Um, So what else has been going on? What other types of jobs have you been doing? I think you said that you had one even more recent than Comic-Con. What was that? Um, That was like a music recording thing, which is fun. I enjoyed Mm -hmm. that a lot. I don't really dabble, you know, even when I went to school for, you know, music recording. I yeah, started that way like started that 15 way. years ago. And that was more to learn how to work in like, you know, DAWs like Acid Pro and Logic and how mm-hmm. to like make electronica. So you weren't really miking instruments. You were just learning how to, you know, run MIDI and all that route stuff. Route all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, route all that stuff. Do you remember how bad Logic was? Yeah. I hated <laughs> that program. Yeah, man. I was always a Pro Tools guy. Uh, same Logic. here, yeah. man. Same here. Throw that thing away. No, I'm kidding. I I use it now, and it's a beautiful. And it's a lot better after 10 or 15 yeah. years of improvement for sure. Jesus. But in like 2002, 2001. It was just yeah. crashing all yeah. the time, and you'd like hit save, and it would crash. I was doing tests and be like, I'm done, and I would hit submit, and it would crash. And they're like, <laughs> oh, you didn't do it, so you failed the class. And it's like, what? Like, yeah. Yeah. like no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, so, um, yeah, so it was like a girl had like a web series, you know, re- recording bands, playing little live songs, like cover songs, you know, environment. So went there, borrowed a couple mics from some people. Thank you, Chris Allen, for your generous contributions to the mics. And um, Charlie also lent me a couple. Nice. Um, but yeah, you know, mic up a snare, hi-hat, you know, kick drum, um, there's acoustic guitar. I got to use one of those little, like, you know, DPA acoustic guitar clip on oh things. nice so you run like a 4061 into it goes right over the strings sounded great um had a really good time it was really nice uh, i could definitely get into more of that awesome yeah you know what are the i mean i could think that recording music live versus recording without the cameras can be very challenging what were some of the challenging moments for you doing this um there were cameras still um challenging moments was just learning like the instruments and the mic placement you know it's not like a we weren't in a recording studio where everything is like sound treated and you can like all right let's mess let's move the mic here on the snare drum oh, it's a little too too sticky let's move it over here it was like set it up quick sound check and then go and record you know right but it was great like i i enjoyed the challenge and i learned a lot about you know mics i don't normally use you know we use shotgun mics and longs, yeah, but now I'm, now I'm breaking out stuff. like yeah like the sm57s and you know the 58s and kick drum mics and all that stuff. And so I, I really enjoyed doing that, going home, listening to it in the DAW and hearing how each mic, you know, picked up the instrument and all that. Yeah, it's probably one of the only jobs where you go home and you're like, I actually want to, like, come yeah, and listen yeah, to yeah. it again and see how it worked and yeah, track it. Exactly. Where all the other ones are like, eh, it's fine. I'll back that up later. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we're just, we, we get so used to recording dialogue. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's fun to record some stuff with a little more dynamics to it. And, yeah. You know, mess around bring in the multi-tracks kind of remix it and you know do all that's that. cool man yeah. that's a lot of fun yeah wow so what's next for do you have anything else lined up um and if not what do you do on the on the sidelines next i don't have anything till like the end of the week i believe um on the sidelines 
working i'm getting back into making music and got my you know my turntables and my mm-hmm. my ableton set up back together so was it the dinner cruise that like you know sparked yeah. your career again you know now you're on like a second wave <laughs> i'm on like a high from that dinner cruise still. <laughs> exactly nobody was there nobody right. saw me i was there yeah, you, and you i enjoyed there. it yeah yeah you know i know uh some people were down the bottom. I don't think people even realized I was down no, there. No, I don't think so. You were like, you were just kind of buried down there. It's okay. It was cool. I was super nervous about that. Um, thank, thank you were Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic. <laughs> you were like at the bottom of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thankfully to uh, Bobby Nice, who also came in and DJed with me. Right. He took a lot of the pressure off. He did the opening and kind of like when people were filling on the boat. Uh, but yeah, that definitely was my first gig back to like DJing, and I really enjoyed it. And That's cool. And I thought, you know. <laughs> I had my turntables in one area, and then I had my Ableton set up in a different area. I'm like, these all need to be put together. And it was all sparked by actually buying speaker stands from Sabi. <laughs> like he was selling these two monitor speaker stands. And I was like, you know what? I can get those. I can put my, take the monitors off the table, put them on the stands, and I can move the table next to them, and I can build this whole thing. And, yeah. That's fun. Yeah, so now I've just been spending a lot of time relearning Ableton and, like, you know, plugins and all that. and messing around man i've never used ableton i've never played around with it is it fun it, it's fun it's a it's a rabbit hole because mm-hmm. it's a program that is made for either recording and tracking or live play so you're going from like you know okay i'm making these using it like an mpc and i'm making you know this beat and okay now i'm gonna record this live as i'm doing it but then i'm gonna also trigger loops and i you know you start you know you never know what you want to do yeah, i'm making a song you I'm can just do so much yeah. stuff it's like it's effortless and limitless exactly that's cool man. yeah so i've been doing that um yeah, other than that, I've just been trying to stay cool in the heat, you know, being lazy. Yeah, so. it, it, it does make you lazy. <laughs> like, even for me and Video Mantis, I'm just like, I just don't want to, like, do anything. Yeah, anymore. I mean, this is great, though. You have this nice little room down here. It's Thank cool you. It's cool in here. Yeah. Some water. We've got a bar happening. Right, you, you know. You guys can't see it. I don't know if it's Tennessee whiskey. We'll, we'll flip it over here. It's my <laughs> oh, insure lens is attached. Hilarious. Uh, there goes, I gotta there hit goes that my button. solo camera. Here we go. Flip that back and go to... Let's go to the, the there it comes. Oh, oh. oh it's sh- yeah. You know what? It's funny. Every once in a while, it like tweaks out, but that is what it's it all is. Right. People can look at my chin. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. It's a nice <laughs> chin. Yeah. Well, so, with that, everyone, I want to say thank you for joining us on this Mantis discussion. Uh, these generally go third uh, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Pacific time. We did this one a little bit later today, but uh, we want to say thank you for joining us, and we we'll see you no, no questions on the next one. No, you know what? I think everybody was just chilling and just saying hello. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, please let us know right here. We were talking a lot about Comic-Con and uh, working at trade shows and things like that, and, you know. But yeah, I would just say be ready for anything of those things. You never know when you're going to have to plug into, like, a board or a press box or something just to get you know whatever so just have all your do you think that these are entry-level positions working at comic-con like do you think that just somebody random can just pick up a bag and just do this Mm. or do you think that this is a little bit more like fast paced and you got to really be on your game i would say depends on the client you know i've seen people go around with just like iphones filming so uh yeah you know and they're, they're they're pretty basic you know dynamic mic stuck on a stick or something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, just know. taped over the top of them. Um, I do think it, it could be entry level if you get the right client. You know, it's if you're just running like a small rig and a lav and a handheld, that's pretty basic for most people. Yeah. You could probably do that. Exactly. It's just the frequency coordinating. Yeah. What are the what are some things that you would recommend for students? Like I guess what I'm trying to say is I like to ask people like the what if if you could go back to the beginning of your career, career with what you know now and say, like, Marty, read these books. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what what would you do to, like, speed your career up? Mm. What would you do to, like, help yourself? What do you think was the thing that you were like, man, if I started, like, really, like, focusing on this or whatever, mm-hmm. that I would be better off? Mm-hmm. What do you think? Um, I think acquiring gear would have been better earlier in my career. I feel like there was a lot of times when I was asked to do jobs as I was progressing that I had to turn down because I didn't have the gear that was needed for that job and rentals would have been way too much to like make it work for what I was, you know? Um, and it also goes back to like the gear buying of like buy once, cry once. Like I wouldn't have wasted money buying like, you know, cheaper gear just to end up buying the better stuff in the, fir- in the wrong run. Let me ask you a question though. Where is the brink of like the mentality of the person of like, you know what, I've read these books, I've kind of immersed online, I've done my research, I know sound, I may not have hit record before, but 
I know that this is what I want to do. Now let's go spend fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Where because what I don't want to do is tell everybody go out and buy a fifty thousand no, no, dollar package no, no, of course and not. and then hurt because they can't get jobs potentially. Yeah. Well, I would say that just goes back to like you know do what you should be doing like be a utility work under like somebody who you know is uh, more established in their career you know learn you know how they work the workflow the you know how different sets are run mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, yeah, you definitely don't want to like bite off more than you can chew, and you know, spend all this money and not have the clientele. Right. But if you are going to get into sound, yeah, like get out there, you know, work under the bigger guys. Um, try every aspect. Try working in you know scripted. Try working in reality. Try working in documentary. Try working in commercial. See how they're all you know run, and pick which one suits you best. You know, because people's personalities don't always work with certain types of filming. Yes, you know, I would definitely agree with that. <laughs> Holy hell, yeah, I'm a prime example of that. Jesus. Yeah, I mean, some people thrive in, <clears throat> excuse me, thrive in scripted. Mm -hmm. And some people just can't do it, you know? Yeah, some people don't like it. Some people like reality. They love just the high-paced, you know, troubleshooting of a reality set where it's like, go, 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 go. Like, you know, mic these people and get them going. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> some people are not used to commercials. You have to deal with clients and agency and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So... And That's it's very protective and, yeah. you know, very separated with the wall that you mm -hmm. yeah, you just have to be very careful. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just uh, there's so many different types of sound jobs. It's not just like, hey, we're here to record whatever comes into the mic. It's also the ability to be personable on the set mm -hmm. in that type of a, uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, I like just depending on the type of job you're doing – you have to act and behave a different type of way. Yeah. You know? And if I was to like Doc Scott myself and go back and like be like, oh, you know, it would have been like meet more people. Because when I first started, there was no Facebook groups. There was no. Oh, my gosh. I remember being invited to the Sound Mixers Barbecue by Seth and uh, Michael Krikorian when it was Seth and Mike. Um, yeah, the uh, Seth Seth's and Cricky's barbecue. barbecue. And, yep. you know, I showed up there and it was like it was very small group and it was the big guys, like the guys yeah. mixing big shows. And I felt out of place, and I, you know, didn't want to bother them because. Can I wash your car? Yeah, because I'm like, I don't want to be the guy who's trying to take work from their guys. Like, hey, if you need somebody, I'm like, I know they got their regular guys, and I wish I would have been more um, active to meeting actually like the bigger mixers and working yeah. them instead of kind of going off on my own and you know working and building my own career that way. Yeah, exactly. There's something to say about the mentor route and all that stuff. For sure. So I wish I had been better about that, and I was also worried like, oh, I don't want to meet these guys these are my competition yeah but fast forwarding a lot of my work now comes from other sound mixers so it's like at the it's same time funny how that works by huh? being scared to branch out and meet more people that they're gonna you know you're also cutting down you know you're possibilities not, possibilities you're not building those bridges so yeah 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 you want to be there and get them to look at you don't want to look at them in the eyes and be like you are my competition yeah exactly <laughs> exactly you're gonna be like you you're an ally and let's all work together and you know you'll you know, I'll help you out. One day you might throw me a gig or we'll work together. But I was really bad at that for like the first four or five years. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, I'm glad that you've definitely gotten past that. That's definitely something that people need to know. Because, uh, you know, that's one of the biggest things that a lot of these students ask. They're just like, I don't know how to get started. I don't know what to do. And it's like, okay, well, you got to get into the group. So is it, is it basically like in today's, in 2018, you need to get into a Facebook group. In no, order. but I mean, it's definitely a lot more accessible to, you know, I'm sure Chris Allen spoke about this on the social networking podcast he did, but getting in there is a lot more accessible. When I, when I got out of recording school, I didn't know anything about like production audio. I didn't, right. I, I never had wanted to work in that world. I didn't know about it. It just happened on me. And, um, now it's so much easier because yeah, there are groups and there are, you know, the community is a lot more welcoming. I feel like than back then or maybe it was welcoming i just didn't know the right people right you have any questions coming right in? no just uh some people are logging in every <laughs> once in a while so i look anytime <laughs> i see it scroll up you know um mm -hmm. guys we're live with evan freeman on a mantis discussion if you guys have any questions for us please let us know we're mm -hmm. gonna be live for a little bit while longer while uh we're just talking um in fact you know what i want to be hit up with a little bit more whiskey I'm oh gonna yeah shoot he's this got this one. yeah this tendency honey I'll, I'll have a little bit more with you here mm-hmm but yeah, um, let's see other mistakes. Yeah, I mean that was basically like all I could have really thought about changing. Oh, oh like man, it. it's all you, baby. You might have to do some cherry or something else. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Well, thank you for that. Cheers, anyways. Cheers. <laughs> mm. 
What about you? What would you change if you had to go back and talk to young pop? Mm. If I had to go back to young pop. When you was just a little colonel. Yeah, man. <laughs> that's a good, I've never heard that one. <laughs> that's really good. Honestly, I've always been like, man, I need to have like a $20 bill because I've heard <laughs> pop goes the weasel, snap, crack a pop. I've heard them all. That's a good one. Um, actually, we have a question. Any Facebook groups that you recommend? Steve Williams is asking. Um, we'll get back to me in a minute. Yeah. Um, where are you? Where is he located? I mean, if he's out of yeah, Cal- where are you if, located, Steve if, Williams? Yeah. Hello. Um, so while he's answering, um, I think what I would say is that when I got into this industry, I was just. Well, I'm from Detroit too, so I was. Everything's kind of. I don't want to say slow in Detroit, but it's just not as fast paced as out here, you know. So when I got on set, everything was just fast, and I. I don't want to say like uh, I have trouble focusing, but sometimes I do when there's just too much going on. I don't know how to narrow down my focus. Mm -hmm. So I think it would just have been. I needed to develop my third ear, as what people would call, (laughs) a little bit faster. And I think it would have helped me because there were so many times where I, was, uh, I just I just didn't know what the F was going mm-hmm. on, you know, because like w- I was doing union television shows when I was like 21 years old. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. Big ones like yeah. where there's like an eight to 10 person cast and I'm having to mic everybody up and check all that stuff and running speakers. And, and I'm just, you know, because I, I got I just got it. But man, like if I was actually like paying attention a little bit more yeah, at that age, it's so hard. You know, it really me. is. You know, you've got to grow into your experience. Yeah. You know, I feel like I had so much book smarts that everybody wanted me because they knew if something went wrong on a card, I could be like, did you did you try this? Mm-hmm. You know, and I could just fix it like that. Now, like I was a whiz at that. But when it came to the set experience, it was a little bit – it took me a little while to learn that. Yeah. And that's honestly one of the reasons why Video Mantis is so important to me because I do think of all the people. You know what? There are so many people in our industry that, you know, had fathers and, oh, they've been in this gener- – they've been holding a boom for five generations. Yeah. It's like, well, of course yeah. you know what to do. You know, instead of giving you a, a sucker or something when you were a kid, they gave you a, a K-Tech pole. <laughs> you know what I mean? So – you know, when you get out here and just everybody expects you to know everything and I'm just like, yeah, but I spent a lot of money on school and they didn't teach me what you're expecting me to know. Yeah. So I'm trying to bridge the gap between the students and professionals. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so this is the way of doing it is saying, hey, you were to Comic-Con. Let's get some of your experience of what they can do, because you know what? Like like you said, bringing food in your backpack and making sure you have comfortable shoes. Mm-hmm. Somebody's going to wear a cheap pair of Target shoes or something oh, yeah, like that. All right. Nothing's going to put you in a bad mood quicker than yeah. some uncomfortable <laughs> shoes after you've taken 10,000 steps. Are you, you know? okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I just want to <laughs> eat a hot dog. I don't care if it's $15. <laughs> Shut up. You know, it's so it's crazy. Uh, he says, uh, Steve Williams says, Central Illinois, middle of Chicago, St. Louis, and Indianapolis. Okay, so what we got, like the freelance sound mixers? Mm-hmm. Um, we have that. We have the Chicago, Chicago. sound mixing group. They yeah. have one for there. Those are definite ones that you want to be in. Yeah, JW Sounds, always mm-hmm. good to, you know, for looking at, you know, those posts. Um, Absolutely. Check into Video Mantis, too. If you're yeah, on iOS, we have the Video Mantis app. We're always adding new gear and stuff. We're talking about adding some more social stuff to it soon, so that's always something to check out. Yeah, um, yeah, Steve Williams. But obviously, just keep keep checking out all the groups and making sure that you network. You know, like like Evan said, if you don't know people, like th- the phone is going to ring. I mean, as cliche as it is, is it really, you know, I never really understood that. It's not what you know; it's who you know. Yeah. You know, comment growing up in L.A. Yeah. And I always thought, well, it's not what you know; it's who you know. So what I've got to know, like directors, and I've got to know like the producers. But no, it's like it goes even down the, the chain like you just got to know everybody because if nobody mm-hmm. knows who you don't know, they don't know who you are nobody's gonna a want to work with you refer you because they don't know your skill set and um they just don't know you as a person you have to think of yourself as a business yeah. you know because that's that's what we're doing we're, we're offering services to our clients yeah and you know even to other sound mixers you know you have to develop a brand they have to remember your name yeah you know like after a while of working like six, seven years on television shows where I was a utility and second unit mixing on days that I could step up, you know, like people just kind of forget your name if you're not going, hi, how you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, I used to be annoyed with people that did that. And then I realized, my God, they're smarter than me. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, I used to get angry. I'm like, God, I just throw this postcard away. This is really <laughs> stupid. Why are you sending me this? 
But at the same time, you know, I called him up one time and he was just like, you know what? Every time I send out a postcard, I get four jobs. Yeah. And it's just like, wow. You it's know? true. And it's weird because our mind works like that. Like you not, you won't always remember somebody. Even if you've worked with them and you're like, they're great. When somebody asks you for somebody or you need somebody to hire, sometimes it's a person who's freshest in your mind that you think of as opposed to somebody you worked with before. That was exactly. great, but they're not there because yep. you just haven't talked to them for yep. a year or you don't know what's exactly. going on. So you're like, oh. You know, so it's always good to check in with people and keep, yeah, you know, the, the bridge. Yeah, it, you know, you're marketing yourself. Uh -huh. That's what you have to do. You have to continually market yourself. Somebody told me a quote one time, and I'm going to butcher it. I'm going to try to do it. Butcher it. But it said something about marketing. Like, if you don't have marketing in your business, it's like trying to wink at a supermodel in the dark. You'll never get her, mm -hmm. you know, because like the idea is that, you know, if you're not putting yourself out there, no one's going to find you. Yeah. No one's just going to search for Evan Freeman or Thomas Pop on YouTube or or Google or whatever. Yeah. If we're not trying to openly put ourselves out there and say, this is what we're doing and we want you to be a part of our lives. Exactly. So, you know, just make sure that you're marketing and putting yourself out there, letting people know who you are. Um, if people get annoyed by it, then don't talk to them, you know, just because you're working on your business and raising your livelihood. But, I mean, they may get annoyed by it, but I guarantee if they need somebody and their regular people are gone, you were the last person to bother them. For sure. They're going to give you a call. They're probably. always going to call the last person that they remember, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah. And you always have to remember, too, that you're always only as good as your last job. Yeah, and every job too. is just an audition for, or a, an interview for the next job. Mm -hmm. you know? It's just basically how it goes. What do you do with, whoops, sorry, I'm getting a little happy with the switcher here. Um, guys, if you have any questions, please let us know. I noticed that a few more people are signing on. You're, you're, you're famous. Familiar? Uh, Steve Williams, well, we already talked to him. Ivan has been saying thank you to both of us. Oh, you're welcome, Ivan. Ivan, if you have any questions, please let us know. Yeah. Um, what was I, what was I going to ask you? Um Gosh, I, to I just totally Sorry, drew – no, that's okay. I just totally drew a blank. I think I we're talking about the last person in their mind. Um, yes, yes, yourself. yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, you. Get, I got it back. Um, when you're working with a brand-new client that you've never gotten before, like they just call you out of the blue, or you get that text message that says it's from somebody <laughs> that's on the other side, you know – um, what do you do? What's your protocol for them? Like, you know, are, do you tighten the tie a little tighter those days? What, what do you do? Oh, on the, on the actual day of shooting? Yeah. Well, everything. Why don't we start from the beginning? Yeah. I mean, usually, you know, I'm always trying to put my best foot forward whenever, you know, obviously in any job, not just a new client, um, mm -hmm. every job. Um, but those ones you just, I just, you know, I, I, I show up, I'm usually early, um, I just try to be enjoyable, you know. I just want them to be like, "Wow, that guy like knew what he was doing, and was fun to be around and like enjoyable to be around," you know. Okay, but here's a question though, because that's uh, and I definitely like those points, but in order to get to that complacency, a lot has to happen before you even show up. And oh, you mean them. like yeah, dealing with like just like on the phone? Yeah. So let let's talk a little bit about that, like, because here's one thing. For example, you get a new client that calls you up on the phone, and everything. And they just ask you for something that's literally like a third of your rate. Mm -hmm. So what do you? What's your protocol for that kind of stuff? Uh, I know it's different depending on the client yeah. and, who's, and what they specifically said, mm -hmm. but you know, like, what do you do? Like, I got a job. Like I said, this commercial client uh, that we just did recently, they wanted to pay five hundred for services and two hundred and fifty for gear, but I found out that it was a Samsung commercial, mm -hmm. and uh, I just found out that there was a lot more going on and it wasn't maybe the proper budget for this. If that happened to you, wh what types of questions would you find out when they just said, oh, it's just one person in front of camera, 500 for gear, 250, I'm sorry, 500 for services, 250 for gear. Um, what would you rebuttal with that? Um, I mean, I would have to ask questions about locations, um, how big, you know, how many cameras there are, is like, you know, how many people are in the camera department. You know, kind of let them know that me working by, you know, at a lower rate or by myself, usually those jobs are asking you to work as a one-man band. You yeah. know, they don't want to hire a boom op or they're really low budget. That I'd be hindering production. And um, also I got to find out where they got my info. If it's like through like another mixer and it's like one of their clients and they can't do it and they sent them to me, I'm obviously going to be a little more 
open to the idea. Flexible, Flexible yeah. because, you know, I, I know I'm now taking care of somebody else's client and I'm not trying to, like, you know. Yeah, exactly. I'm t- helping you out because of him. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, this is, like, a friend. This isn't my rate. Yeah, exactly. Type and I deal. always let them know. I'm like, that's below my rate and this is what my normal rate is. Um, is there any way we can, you know, work up, you know, you know, the rate a little bit? What can I see a script? Can I see exactly what we're shooting so I know what we're dealing with? Um, I need to know like locations, like what kind of like the parking and all this stuff. Am I going to be schlepping gear up a mountain by myself and, you know, running around all over the place? Right. Or am I going to be are we literally doing one line of dialogue and that's it? And um, yeah, I mean, I just usually tell them like this is my rate. And if I'm doing it for this, this is like a discount as a friend, as a favor for like whoever referred you to me. Right. But sometimes I just have to pass on a job. I say, this is, I can't do it for that rate. Um, I can't leave myself booked. If another job comes up, I'm going to have to bail on you. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. I don't want to do that to you. So it's like, I either need you to come up to my rate so I can book it, or I need to leave the day open for somebody, somebody else. Interesting. Okay. I mean, it works. I mean, because, you you know, and then what happens is on the days, then they start asking for more and more things. Of course. Depending on what happens. Yeah. The buffet mentality, I call it. Yeah. Ah, I mean, and that's very interesting. I try my best to get a pre-order of what they want to order, <laughs> you know, yeah. so we can cook their salmon just right. Um, and then, yeah, usually I'll send an email with, like, gear. Like, this is what I'm bringing. This is what we negotiated. If you're asking for more stuff on the day, there's going to be subject to extra charges, you know. Right, and I think that that's one of the biggest things that a lot of people need to know is that, you know, with this, with this client, because it wasn't a new client for me. It was a newer client. It was the second time that they wanted to hire me. So the first time, I kind of just took their rate, yeah. and, you know, because I was feeling them out. And it was a referral, and everything was okay. Um, but then this time came around, and I just wanted, like I said, I was asking a little bit more information and found out, you know, they have a DIT station. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of people. They full grip and lighting crew. Yeah, I started fighting for a little bit more. Now, they weren't able to budge on the boom operator, but I was able to get the rate up. Mm-hmm. And I think that the biggest thing to tell people is that we need to let them know is that you need to itemize every single piece of gear that you're going to use on the job. Yeah, exactly. If you go to one of these rental shops anywhere in the world and you say, hey, I need to rent equipment and you tell them what you're going to do. I'm going to shoot a show about this. They're going to go through and they're going to say, you need this, 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 and you need 500 cables, and you need these connectors, and you need all this, and this mm-hmm. is everything. And they're going to give you a list, and you're going to be like, okay, and you're going to pay for it, and you're going to rent it, and that's what it is. Yeah. The thing that I don't understand is that, li- and that even happens in the camera world. That literally happens for our camera brothers and sisters. But then we come down to when they are hiring us, and they just say, okay, 250 for your kit. And it's just like, that's what it is. I don't like to work that way. I no. like to tell them, well, okay, well, but what is that kit? Yeah. Because that kit for you and for me might be a little bit different because it's our own gear. We're not just renting from a rental house and then putting it together. We're, we're building this over years of our lives to make it work specifically for us. So it's a highly specialized thing. So we need to, you know, break it down. And by doing that list, when I turn it into these guys, what ended up happening is they said, they actually apologize. They're like, Thomas, I'm sorry. I had no idea that we under budgeted like this. We had no idea yeah. that this is what it really costs. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm actually even giving you a discount, yeah, you know, exactly. on this. So, you know, we're still not at the actual rate, you know. Um, well, I think we're like the the problem with that is is I think producers, they think of a law of a law. They don't care if it's Electro, if it's a Sennheiser. They right. Think, and, and when there's cheaper options out there and somebody's like, okay, well, we need two laws and a recorder. And they can either get a guy with two Sennheisers and a you know a Zoom, or a guy with Electros and a and a you know sound devices or a Zaxcom. Yeah. In their mind, it's the same thing. It's two lobs and a mixer. They don't care what the brand is. We care because you know we don't want to use something that's gonna you know it's inferior. It makes our jobs harder. So exactly. We, we come bringing them more stuff, but they just like well we want to pay this because that's what the last guy brought. Exactly. And, and yeah. I mean I, and another thing I'm finding that is also annoying to me is to in case like oh can we bring we might need five wires, six wires. Can we bring them in case? But if can we just pay you for what you, you we use? And it's like, well, let's ask a rental house that yeah, same yeah, question like, and see what they say. They're gonna hang up the phone because that's not a rental. Yeah. Do you want to rent it or do you not want to? Exactly. Rent it? And that's what it costs. Yeah. So they're like, oh, we need three hops, and I said that's great. They're like, can we bring them just in case? I said no. I need to rent them because I don't. All my wireless are gonna be maxed out for cast. Yeah. And if I rent them. 
you're paying for them. Like, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to go rent them and then bring them just in case you want to use them. Exactly. Because you said kit and kit mm-hmm. means all my gear. Mm-hmm. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We have to consider ourselves rental houses, but you know, there has to be a point of where you say, no, that's, if you're having to sub rent other gear, they have to just, that's part of the cost. Yeah. I'm like, this, 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 this receipt is going right to you. Mm-hmm. Like whatever I'm sub renting is going right. I'm not going to charge even, you more. I'm just going to let you know what it costs and you can have it. Right. Cause that's not even part of our basic kit. Once again, you know, yeah. that's something extra. Oh, you want us to send audio to camera wirelessly. We can do that. But we don't necessarily have to send audio to camera wirelessly. That's yeah, an and we know it's and we know it's also somewhat not necessary a lot of times. Yeah, it's just for them to like make editing easier when you know. Exactly. So. Or complicate the chain later if you. Ask yeah, me. exactly. And yeah. that was like one of the things on the Comic Con gig was they wanted wireless, you know, hops to the cameras instead of hard lines, and I was like, you know. They're telling me they need six wireless and six handhelds, and I was like, it's hard to find a couple good frequencies. Yeah, in San exactly. Diego, if we Comic get Con. one good wireless frequency, yeah. you're so lucky. You want, you know, you want to add. Now you're trying to add, you know, three more just for no, or at least one more if you're doing. But they want me splitting different cameras. Now I need three different yeah, sends. Yeah, it's three a different recipe hops. for disaster. Yeah, so I'm like, you know, that's just becoming a problem. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah we didn't really think about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sound is magic. I like to explain it as like uh, Doctor Strange. We are Doctor Strange yeah. people because we deal with frequencies and like things think that I th- people don't I know think, about. I think producers are really need to learn about frequencies more than gear because they don't really think about that. They think you just put a mic on somebody and it works. And like, it works, exactly. They don't, they don't realize like what we deal with. To that, get it to that, that is round. a marvel of technology. Yeah. You know? And the more you add, the more complicated it gets. Mm, so. Yeah. One of these days, hopefully they'll understand. That's a goal, too, is, you know, not only have Video Mantis teach sound guys, but to teach everyone else what we do and to understand, you know, hopefully, you know, if a DP or a camera operator or a producer listens to this, they go, oh, wow, maybe I, d- I never knew that. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should dive into that a little bit more. So, yeah. you know, we're trying to heal the world, make it a better place. Oh, man. Well, generally, what is a basic kit to most mixers? Eric Buckland is asking. What would you think is a basic kit? And and the first thing that I would say, Eric, is just to make sure. I know that we're saying basic kit. We're going to say that in the safety of this Mantis discussion. <laughs> okay, we're not going to get greedy and put that on those quotes. I wouldn't even put basic kit and then subline things. Yeah. I just get rid of that word. Yeah. Say, here's the equipment. If I'm doing my services and my equipment on the same invoice, I'll put my services and my boom operator services and have a subtotal. And then underneath that, it, it's like, here's all the equipment I'm yeah. renting. Yeah. But I don't say, like, this is the basic kit. Yeah. I just, this is the gear. Yeah. What do you do? Um, that's what I do. I mean, when I first started, my basic kit was a basic kit. It was a 302. And, you know, I always thought of a basic kit as, like, two lobs and a boom and, a, and a, you know, a three-channel mixer. So you, Yeah. If we're talking about that, and that's, that's like what basically, it is. Two wires and a boom. But, yeah. And a basic, recorder. Yeah. But ba- in, back, it wasn't even a recorder. It yeah, was you're like, right. A recorder was, was – I was charging extra for a recorder. It was like right. I was going to, like, a DVX or, you know, to camera. I mean, really a basic, basic patch would be a mixer and a boom. No wire. You yeah. Know, and, you know, a dummy sleep. Which is funny because half the time some of these producers don't even understand if they would just talk to us. Mm-hmm. And find out, hey, we're recording in a very good, clean environment because I subcon- I was listening when we did our location scout. And we know that we don't need wireless because we're shooting really tight interviews. So we just need a boom mm-hmm. going into a recorder and we don't need wireless because yeah. it will sound better. Yeah. You know, like sometimes I will tell people, yeah, I don't need to rent this to you. Why do you want to pay for it? Exactly. You know, yeah, sometimes you have to be the good guy and be like, yeah, I'm not going to charge you. You don't need this. But. I feel like a lot of them take that as a right flag, like saying like, oh, you don't need these wireless. Well, what what if we do? Like, why is he saying that? Then I will gladly rent it to yeah, you. Exactly. You know, I mean, I have no problem putting another zero on that invoice. I just can't say how many times I've had, you know, somebody like an AD be like, oh, we need to wire this person or a PA come up to me like we need this person wired. I'm like, well, actually, we don't like we're, we're in coverage and it's really tight. We're, mm-hmm. we're just quiet. We're just going to use the boom. And then I get a look like, why aren't you wiring them? Why do you think and that I know happens? Some, and I know some show's policy is to wire everybody no matter what. Like, they always yeah. get wires, even if they just have it because of improv and camera styles. But Camera changes and stuff, yeah. yeah. On, on all narrative shows now, that's just kind of that's how it's done. par, yeah. Mm-hmm. So. And it's it's frustrating sometimes, you know, especially because, you know, it, it takes until, like, the ninth month of a ten-month show for them to finally understand if I stagger these guys to you, that makes your life easier, right? 
Yes, you for the hundredth time. While they're standing around drinking coffee over your shoulder. And <laughs> wondering, like, God, these young guys don't know. It's like, no, we know exactly what we're doing, but we have two f- two hands and one person in front of us. Can't mic up people like this. Meanwhile, while they're, like, reading their script, talking to, the, like, the director, and they're not yep. paying attention to you, and you're trying to work around them yep. while they're on their phone and how, holding a coffee. and uh, You know. It is part of the fun. It's part of the fun. It's part of the it's fun. Part of the fun. It is what it know, is. It's a, everything is a puzzle. Every yep. job is a puzzle, and you just gotta figure out the pieces you need to put it together. Yeah. So. You know what? I want to kind of go back to Aaron Buckland's question for yeah. a second here, and uh, saying, you know, what's part of a basic kit? So we talked about the, you know, couple at max, at max, two wires and a boom, and nowadays a mixer recorder. Yeah. You know, to record something that way. What is not part of the basic package? You know, what Comtex, would you say? Context, locket boxes, smart slates, all, all that, that all stuff. All hops, all that stuff. A basic package is a basic package. It's like I should be able to get. And like I said, when I started, it was basic package was plugged into camera. There was no recorder. Like, you want a recorder? That's going to cost extra for me to hook up, like, you know, right. give you a separate copy. Um, yeah, it's kind of a freebie nowadays. It's just kind of thrown in in a way. It's because it's become all one unit. It's like, oh, you can just hit that button. You know, mm-hmm. even even when they first come out, it was like, oh, I'm charging an extra seventy five bucks just to hit record. You want record, you know, and people were charging by the track. Like, you want four tracks, five tracks? I'm charging you per track. You wow, know? that was people were doing that for a while, but now yeah, it's become standard. It's no, yeah, now you can't do that. Mixer recorder, boom. You know, 416, and or even like, even if you don't have that, like an NTG3 or NTG4. Because you even think about it, you know, from there, it's like, let's say you're doing an interview. So, fine, you have your mixer recorder. That's, you know, anywhere between $100 and $200, depending on the mm-hmm. one that you're using, mm-hmm. right? You have your shotgun microphone, which is going to be 25 to $50 because you've got to have the boom pull. you got to have the cable. You have to have the shock mount. You have to have the wind protection. Mm-hmm. Wind protection for a silly microphone can be anywhere between $100 and $1,000. And they don't $1, think about that. Yeah, yeah, and that's another thing that people don't think about is like all the little connectors yeah. and, and things we have to have to make stuff work properly. All yeah, the time. any, not any just given mic- time we have, what, $1,000 worth of cables in our bag. Yeah. Just of cables, yeah. you know, that if we don't have or they break, we're screwed. So yeah. we better have backups. Exactly. That's it's all part of the kit. Those camera guys, they just show up with their tape roll and <laughs> they're ready to go. I guess a basic kit, basic kit would have no backups. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's kind of crazy. But uh, I guess what else? Earwigs. So, uh, you know, you brought up one good thing, all of the Comtex and stuff like that. <coughs> one person told me that it's anything that doesn't help me improve the mix. Exactly. I, I agree with that. You know, time code doesn't help me record the audio from the talent better. It helps you sync up your stuff between sound and picture. Mm-hmm. Time code slates, same thing. Agency, 7, 8, 9, 10, context, however many you want, I, that's fine. Anybody can listen, but that is something outgoing from me to help you listen mm-hmm. so if you want it i can get it but it's per unit exactly you know because if not then you're just passing on all these things i think what happens is some sound mixers they get a little bit worried because they're like okay fine uh three hundred dollars all in for my package and then they're like well, you, they show up on the day and they're like well, we have 16 agency where are your contacts it's like do you realize that 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 alone costs more than a 300 hundred dollar rental mm-hmm. what is it i mean what, what 350 times 16 what is six times 15 no, six times 50, 50, I can't even do 30, the math. 60, 90, 90, 900? That's $90 a day. $90 then a you got to add the transmitter. So that's, you know, another, what, 50 no. to a 75? So. No, you're you know, talking about rental costs, not. Yeah, purchase you know. Costs, yeah. yeah j- oh, yeah. Just for that, if you're purchasing, gosh, you know, $388 per receiver. Yeah. Transmitter is about a thousand, but yeah, you're looking at a hundred and fifty dollars a day just for that. Just for that, yeah. What about all the other stuff? You know, a time code slate's fifty bucks. Yeah. You know, that's just way too much to expect anyone to bring. So we need to get. You know, I think that people just don't understand us. They like it when oh, sound just works, but I don't have to see them. Mm-hmm. So the more we can start teaching people, well, we're here when you can hear us when you need to. Mm-hmm. And other than that, as long as they understand a little bit more about us and our procedures and what we do, because, heck, if we can't find the education to learn this stuff, how do we expect them to know it? Yeah. Um, the more we can educate them on our processes and how we do it and saying, hey, this isn't this a monkey can't do this. Um, the more it's going to help our cause and the more it's going to make them realize. I think education is the only way to not kill our trade. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. You know? Well, that's why I applaud you for what you're doing. You know, you're getting it out there. Do what we can, man. Everybody can. has to do their thing to help, you know? Yeah. So that's about it. 
Oh, well, thank um, you for having me. Yeah, buddy. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for watching this Mantis discussion. Once again, we are here with Evan Freeman. And we just want to say that this is also sponsored by KTEX. So if you guys have a moment, please check them out online. They have so many great products for sound mixers and sound utilities. Uh, they have some new stuff that's going to be coming out next August uh, that uh, we're going to be talking about in the very, very near future. And they also have their KTEC Aero line, which is behind Evan, uh, which you guys should be checking out as well if you're just getting into the industry. So if you guys have any questions, please let us know. Leave them in the comments. And another quick thing, we have Doc Justice from Halter wow. Technical nice. coming on Thursday. He's going to be showing the brand new scene monitor that came out. Have you seen these yet? No. These are the new... Comtech earphones oh, that people are going to be buying. You the know the, 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 to replace the the one side. You know the LSC headset, yeah. headset ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like basically, you know, I don't know if people know the story. We'll talk about it more on Thursday. Um, but the long story is like a long time ago, Sennheiser made this set of headphones, and it was a cheap pair of headphones. Um, and they branded their Sennheiser logo on it, made a ton of them, and then they said, you know what, we're going to discontinue them. We're just we're done with it. Yeah. And the story is, and maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I've heard through the grapevine, is that LSC took wind of this and said, no, 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 we'll buy like X amount, and they bought thousands and thousands yeah. upon them, maybe like ten or twenty thousand of them, and it took them like twenty or fifty, you know, ten or twenty years to, you know, burn through burn, all of yeah, them. Yeah, and now. Now they're gone, yeah. so now they're a rarity. It's like catching Pokemon. You better <laughs> keep them. Um, but, yeah, so now they're like – they went back, and they're like, listen, they've been discontinued for a long time. We're not bringing them back. Tough. So everybody's been on the lookout for these new ComTech headsets, yeah. and I really think that this Halter Technical Scene Monitor is the one that people are going to like. So we're going to look at it under the microscope and stuff. You'll have to check it yeah, out. Yeah, no, I'm very excited to see that. There's yeah. been a gap for that, you know, or a void for headphones. I've gotten some, but they're all the double cables, and it's yeah. kind of people, producers hate that. They're so. amazing, dude. Yeah. yeah, I used them on another job recently. And so we're going to check them out. That'll be Thursday at 2 p.m. if you guys want to check it out. But thank you once again for thank joining you. this Mantis discussion with Evan. We'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. We'll see you Tuesdays at 2 p.m. for new ones. Take care.